Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Torah study, Pasha Shlach. And uh, tonight the discussion is how much we matter, or what we do, how much does it matter? And tonight's class is actually in uh, memory of my father-in-law, which tonight is the yard site, Chav Gimel Sivin, the 23rd day of Sivin. And uh, Rabbi Tzvi Bronstein, he was very instrumental in bringing us here in Sheepshead Bay, making sure that there is a Chabad here in this community. And um, it's uh, the, the topic of the classes it really also describes his personality, that you matter. Yes, even you that uh, this was something that he really he was in his life caring for each individual and giving personal attention to each individual. So may his neshama have an aliyah and uh, may we all be reunited very soon with the coming of Mashiach. That should happen very soon. Amen. Okay. So um, so, like, so again, what is it? The topic we're discussing tonight is about how much each individual act matter. You know, sometimes you may think to yourself, really, what what I do, what I contribute to the world, does it really count that much? I mean, if I am not, after all, I didn't uh, discover electricity or the tesla or you know major major things i'm a small person doing working in my daily life getting up in the morning going to work doing the little things what i do will anybody even feel or miss anything what i'm doing in this world would the world not go as according to plan if i'm not here so the feeling of importance is what we want to take out today. And not only the feeling of importance, but the feeling of how much the little things, the, the small things what we do is important. And really important to Hashem. So we're talking about the story, we're starting with the story of the spies. It was a tragic story. It was right before um, the Jews were supposed to enter the land of Israel and they're sending in spies. Moshe Rabbeinu sends 12 spies to check out the land to see whether uh, what is the, the best places to enter, what it looks like, is it a good land, and so on. So they're supposed to come back with a, with a report and 10 of the 12 spies while in the beginning, all of them were very virtuous, righteous people, people of stature, but they changed. And they decided to come up with a story which had some truth to it, but to basically scare the people away, the Jewish people. And as a result, the Jewish people cried. They came and they described what they saw. They brought back the fruits, which was gigantic fruits. This is eight people had to carry one stock of uh, grapes, huge grapes, huge fruits. But they said, you see these fruits? That's exactly the people, that's exactly describes the way the people look. If these fruits are like that, imagine what the giants, and, and indeed they were, they were great giants. And they said to the people, it's impossible. We cannot, we cannot conquer it. So that story had a tragic ending. They made all the people cry. However, there were two of the spies, Yehoshua ben Nun and Kalev ben Yefune. Those two were righteous people, and they insisted, and they said, we can go. Hashem is with us, we can conquer it, and we're going to be successful. 
But the people were overwhelmed. And when they heard the reports, they cried. And Hashem said, you cried for no reason. You don't want to go into the land. That's what they said. Why, why are you bringing us here in the desert to die? Take us back to Egypt. And Hashem said, okay, you're not going in. And indeed, as a result, they stayed in the desert for 40 years where this generation passed away and only the next generation came into the land of Israel. So we're starting with the story, we're starting with the answer. Yeshua, Binun, and Kalev, Benifuna, the two righteous spies, what they said. It says the Torah, the Yeshua Binun, the Kalev Benifuna, Yeshua ben Nun and Kalev, uh, the son of Yifuna, who were among those who had scouted the land, tore their clothes. And they heard those terrible words, what they said about the land of Israel. And they spoke to the entire congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we passed through to scout is an exceedingly good land. And now these verses is what we're going to focus on. It says, if God desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us. A land flowing with milk and honey. But you shall not rebel against God and you will not fear the people of that land for they are as our bread. What does it mean? Piece of cake. <laughs> like eating a piece of bread. Their protection is removed from them, and God is with us. Do not fear them. Okay? What are they saying? What are they saying, Yeshua Binun and Kaliv? They're giving them two reasons why we should not be afraid. The other spies, they scared the people away. And the Yeshua Benun and Kalev say, do not be afraid. Why not? Number one, Chafetz Banu Hashem. Hashem desires us. And number two, they say, their protection was removed. And that's what we want to focus today. What does that mean? So those are the two things they said. God desires us. He loves us. And do not be afraid. The non-Jews aren't protected. I guess there was a cyber attack there. In any case, Rashi explains, it says, what does it mean that their protection was removed from them? It says Rashi, their shield and strength was removed. What does it mean? Their virtuous ones have died, namely Job. We know the story with Eov, Job. He was a righteous man, and he lived among them. And when he died, as long as he was alive, his righteousness protected them. And once he died, then that protection was removed. That's not one thing that Rashi says. Then Rashi says another interpretation. What does it mean when they say, that their protection was removed, says Rashi. It says, the shade of God has departed from them. So this is what we need to understand. I, we, we understand the first one, that they had a righteous person, Eov, Job, protecting them. He died. Okay, protection is gone. They're open, and we can go, and we can conquer them. But what does the second thing mean? When we're saying the protection of God was removed from them, the shade, the shade, God, the shade of God has departed from them. What exactly does that mean? So when we're talking about, in general, about the concept of shade, shade of God. Generally, the Baal Shem Tov says, there's a verse, it says, Hashem Shomrecha, Hashem Tzilcha Al Yad Yemenecha. 
God is your guardian. I'm going to see it inside. There's, um, there's a verse in the Psalms. We say, God is your guardian. God is your shadow. He is by your right hand. The Baal Shem Tov says in this verse, when we say, Hashem Tzilcha, God is your shadow, the Baal Shem Tov says literally what this means, that Hashem acts as a reaction to what we do. There's actually a story once the Al Rebbe saw the Tzemach Tzedek. He was praying, he was praying with a very somber tone, and the Al Rebbe told him, don't do that. He says, why? Because when you pray that way, with bitterness, with, with uh, sadness, you are like the shadow. Hashem is like your shadow. Like, it's like whatever you do, Hashem mimics what you do. So when you will do something with joy, with, with, with happiness, that calls upon also happiness from above. So that's what's something that we got to keep in mind. But here says the Baal Shem Tov. Okay. Baal Shem Tov says the following explanation to the words, God is your shadow. God conducts himself with humans as a shadow. Just as whatever a person does is mimicked by their shadow, God mimics what a person does, treating them as they behave. As the Rebbe explains this also, it says the explanation for God, God's shadow is that a person's actions triggers a reaction on high that mimics our actions. God's shadow vis-a-vis non-Jews means this. It says God doesn't withhold reward from any creature. And as such, their action also triggers a reaction from on high. Something is bestowed upon them. In other words, when they do a good deed, a good deed, they are given reward. And when they commit a violation, a reaction from on high is made out that mimics their action. If it was a violation, then the reaction is likewise destructive, meaning a punishment. However, having explained this, we still have the question of what does it mean when we say that God has removed the, his shadow from them? So what is it, exactly does it mean? That there is no... There is no God's providence on them anymore. What, what exactly does it mean? So to understand this, we need to really explain a little bit the whole idea of divine providence in general. Hashgacha pratis, as we say. Now this concept is a really, this topic is a really wide topic. It's uh, discussed among many different sages. We're not going to go cover everything here. Just we're going to focus on one central point and especially what is related to what we're talking about. So we're going to bring first the, the view of the Maimonides. The Maimonides' view is, and basically I'm going to say it out and then we're going to read it in detail the way he writes it. He says basically that divine providence what Hashem has is on humans. On humans, Hashem has individual watching each individual what it does. But in general, on other creatures in the world, the Maimonides claims that there is no individualistic providence on each individual act of each individual creature and animal. In general, there is a divine providence and the, and the kind of species, but not an individual like, like there is by humans. Because he connects it, he says that this is related to choice. When you choose and you do the right thing, and when you, have, you use your intellect, and you're using it to do what Hashem wants, that in turn has an effect 
of what Hashem, how much Hashem cares for what you do. Let's let's see it inside the way Maimonides says this in the in the guide for the perplex. Says there Maimonides, in the lower or sublunary portions of the universe, divine providence does not extend to the individual, to the individual member of species, except in the case of mankind. As regards all other living beings, and certainly as regards plants and all the rest of earthly creatures, I do not believe, says the Maimonides, that it is through the guidance of divine providence that a certain leaf drops from a tree, nor do I hold that when a certain spider catches a certain fly, that this is direct a result of a special decree and will of God in that moment. In all these cases, the action is according to my opinion entirely due to chance. That's what the Rambam says. It says, my opinion is based on the fact that I have not met in any of the prophetical books with a description of God's providence other, otherwise than in relation to human beings. He says only human beings have this kind of providence. Our opinion is not contradicted by verses such as, there's a verse that says, you, God, open your hands and satisfy the desire of every living thing. We say it every day in the prayer that comes from Psalms. Or by the saying of our sages that God sits and feeds all from the horns of the unicorns, even unto the eggs of the insects. State, st uh, statement from the Talmud. So here it seems like there is individual providence. Says the Rambam, no. Says there are many similar sayings extant in the writings of our sages, but they imply nothing that is contrary to my view. It says all these passages refer to providence in relation to species, that God in general protects the species, and not to the providence in, the, in relation to individual animals. Okay, so that's what the Rambam says. And the Rambam also goes on to explain why he, in his opinion, humans are different than animals. So he says, because it's about the choice, it's about the logic, it's about the intellect, what we do. We hear for a mission, as the Rambam continues here. Why should God select humans as, an, as the object of his special providence and not other living beings? Says so the Rambam, one who asks this question must also ask, why has humanity alone, of all species, been endowed with intellect? The answer to this second question must be, it was the will of God, it is the decree of his wisdom, or it is in, in accordance with the laws of nature. The same answer applies to the first question. So being that this is the way God created us with intellect, so that's why Hashem chose us and, and has the providence on, on us. The way the Rambam says, divine providence is related and closely connected with the intellect because providence can only proceed from an intellect being, from a being that is itself the most perfect intellect. Those creatures, therefore, that receive part of, the inte of that intellect, intellectual influence, will become subject to the action of providence in the same proportion as they are acted upon by the intellect. Not only that, Ramam goes even further to say that not all humans are equal, actually. 
They say people who are not acting according to the intellect, meaning acting smart and in, in, in the way Hashem wants. So the providence there is less than those, than those people that really do what Hashem wants. It's interesting. I gave today a class for, for, uh, in a high school for teenage girls, and then one of the questions they asked, why Moshe Rabbeinu was punished so severely when he didn't want to hit the rock? Hashem punished him severely. He, he didn't. He didn't give. He didn't give in, and he, he didn't come into the land of Israel. And the answer, one of the answers, was because when a tzaddik does something, it says, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu men dakdekim tzaddikim kechuta sarah." Hashem is very particular with the righteous people like a split, like a hairline, meaning a righteous person is supposed to be so pure, so clean, that even the, min, the most, minor, most minor infraction causes Hashem to pay attention to it. So in a sense, that is similar to what the Rambam says here, that it is, it depends on the person. And that's what the next Rambam says, this one. It says, in according with what I have mentioned in the preceding chapter, it follows that the action of divine providence is proportional to the endowment of the intellect. The relation of divine providence is therefore not the same by, to all people. The greater the human perfection a person has attained, the greater the benefit he derives from divine providence. And it says, this benefit is very great in the case of prophets and, and varies according to the degree of the prophetic faculty. Just as it varies in the case of pious and good men according to their piety and uprightness. In the same proportion as ignorant and disobedient person are deficient in that divine influence, their condition is inferior and their rank equal to that of irrational beings. They are, they are likened to beasts. Comes a verse in the psalm. They, look, they seem like uh, animals. This belief that God provides for every individual human being is in accordance with his merit is one of the fundamental principles on which the law is founded. So what does that mean? Does it mean that when it comes to animals, there is no divine providence at all? Hashem doesn't know, doesn't care. Absolutely not. The Rambam clarifies. It doesn't mean that Hashem doesn't know what's happening. Hashem does is aware of every individual act, everything. But what that means is that the question, according to the Rambam, how much does he care? How much does Hashem care, for lack of other words? So here the Rambam says, Kol saying all existence aside from the Creator, from the first form down to the smallest mosquito in the depth of the earth of the earth came into being from the influence of his truth since he knows himself and recognize, recognizes his greatness beauty and truth he knows everything and nothing is hidden from him this is this is a topic we covered also in the tanya the Rambam, the, what the Rambam explains that Hashem knows everything by knowing Himself. So it is everything is within Himself. Now, so the question is, what is the difference then? What is the difference between the divine providence that there is in the human and divine providence that there is on the animals, other creatures. And the way to understand it, according to the Rambam, is like we said, 
the attention that Hashem pays to them. The attention that Hashem pays to humans is that's that's what's important. The other creatures, yes, they're here in the world, Hashem created them, but they, are they that important? Is whatever they do so important to the, the overall picture? I mean, think of a, a movie director. Let's say he wants to shoot the scene, he wants to have a famous singer singing, and there's a concert, so he brings hundreds and hundreds of people, and the singer performs in the movie. So the director will stand and will care to every detail what the singer, the way he dresses, the way he moves, his mood, his movement, every little detail is, is important. The hundreds of people that are there, are they that important? What they wear? What they, yes, it's important, but that doesn't take that much importance. So in a, in a way, that's the way the Rambam sees the whole picture. That Hashem's attention is to those who, who, ma- who matter, those who follow his words, those who carry out his wishes. Those are the things that, that they matter. And the Ramadi says, I understand thoroughly about my theory that I do not ascribe to God the ignorance of anything or any kind of weakness, chas So the way he sees it, that God is aware of the entire universe, but only pays attention to human beings. And the difference between the humans and animals is uh, in a more practical thing, is that the humans, they are being that whatever they do matters, meaning what do they, they do, whatever they do, it's by choice. And there is also consequences. That is why those things matter. Whatever, when an animal does something, there's no consequences. So the actions, therefore, is not as important to Hashem. And this is what the Rambam says. It comes from Rabbi Yosef Alba. It says, in as much as God, God's knowledge embraces everything that exists and happens in the world, and nothing great or small is hidden from him, he necessarily knows the animals, but he takes no notice of them individually to reward or punish them for the deeds. He provides for the individuals as part of the species, He's, he, uh, which he preserves, and no more, not individual. Now, the Maimonides explains that this is, therefore, when we see something happens, when we see something happens, when something happens by animals, let's say uh, in, in, in the jungle in Africa, one elephant got sick and, and a thousand elephants contracted and they all died. Do you attribute any meaning to, to, to this event? Is it something that you can say? Why, why did they all die? They all died because they were along with, the, they, they, were got, they contracted the virus from the, from the others. But if this same thing happens, God forbid, to humans, yes, it is because of, and that, we, that the people got infected from other people, if people got infected with the virus or whatever, now we are still in the pandemic or Hashem are getting out of it. But if we will say just that this is okay, just a coincidence, just a, it's, it's a matter of the, the, the nature, that's what happens. The Rambam says if, this hap- if something happens, you should always pay attention and realize that there is a spiritual and message behind it. 
you must always look and to see what went wrong. You have to search in within yourself. Where can I fix? What is what are the things that Hashem want me to fix? And by the way, this when we're saying what Hashem want me to fix, it's not to point finger on others. If God forbid you see somebody else suffers, you don't say, "Oh, okay, he suffers because he did something wrong." This is something that only for yourself you should say. When it comes to others, you should always say and defend others and say Hashem needs to help them. In any case, this is what the Rambam says. It says, when a difficulty arises and people cry out to Hashem and sound the trumpet, everyone will realize that the difficulty occurred because of the evil conduct. As the prophet Jeremiah states, your sins have turned away the rains and the harvest climbed. This realization will cause the removal of this difficulty. Conversely, should the people fail to cry out to God and sound the trumpets and instead say, what has happened to us is merely a natural phenomenon. And this difficulty is merely a chance occurrence. This, says the Rambam, this is a cruel conception. A cruel conception of things that causes them to remain attached to the wicked deeds. Thus, this time of distress will lead to further distress, God forbid. So, so this is what the Rambam says. That there is a difference between animals and humans. Now the question is, what, what about the divine providence among people who, who are not Jewish. Is it, is it the same? And there is actually also different you know, opinions about this, but the, the Rambam does say that also about not Jewish people, there is also a similar divine providence. And based on what they do, is basically depends on their, on their choice. And when a person chooses to do something good, out of his choice, it, it has an effect of the divine providence on that person. So this is, we explain the view of the Rambam, the Maimonides. However, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, the Baal Shem Tov came and he, and he taught a deeper understanding in Hashkacha Pratis, in divine providence. And he says that divine providence is in an every little detail in the creation. Animals, plants. And as the story goes, that the Baal Shem Tov once took his a group of students out to the trip, to the field. They went into a forest and the Baal Shem Tov told them to watch a leaf fall off the tree. And they saw how the leaf fell and covered a worm on the ground. This was a very hot day. And the leaf gave protection and shade to the worm. And they continued to watch it. And they saw once the sun went down, the worm ate the leaf. And the Baal Shem Tov taught them the lesson that the leaf does not fall off a tree without divine providence, without Hashem guiding it individually to do what it needs to do. Now, do we know, do we understand all these billions and billions of, of things that are happening every single second? No, we don't understand. But God is infinite. His wisdom is infinite. And all the activities, the ripple effect that each one has, like the famous saying with the butterfly, moving its wings that has the ripple effect that it has. 
So the ripple effect that all of the little individual acts, says the Baal Shem Tov, is by divine providence. Everything is meant and is meant to do to serve a certain purpose. So the Baal Shem Tov basically, he radically changed this consensus. Here we're going to read the, uh, from Pinchas Karatza, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tov. It says, a person must believe that even a blade of grass lies on the ground by dint of God, who decreed it to lie there. And then it says something even more interesting. It says, I heard in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, I believe in this very language as follows. It says, divine providence is concerned with which direction the blade of grass will lie. Will it lie this way, that way? It's all by divine providence. And again, do we understand? Of course not. It's way beyond our capabilities. But God is infinite and every little detail is important. Now, the previous Rebbe went even further. The previous Labavitcher Rebbe says, not only does an individual act important, it's by divine providence, but each individual act really has an integ it's integral to the overall purpose of creation. Meaning the whole creation would not be perfect if that leaf wouldn't fall on the ground in this moment in this direction. Again, that school text takes it even to the next level. It's way beyond our understanding. But this is the way the Frida Kareb explains that's what divine, truly divine providence is. It says the Frida Kareb in the Sefer Amaamarim. 5696, it says, for example, a blade of grass may move deep in the forest or drop atop a tall mountain or in the depths of the sea that no man has ever seen. It says every movement of that blade of grass to the right, left, forward, backward, for the entire lifespan of that grass is by divine providence. By God who ordained that this blade should live for this many years and move around at this frequency for so long. What's, what's more, every individual motion of that blade of grass contributes to the overall purpose of creation. The aggregate of all the myriads, indeed an infinite number of individual actions from countless creatures distributed across the four taxon taxonomies of inanimate, plant, animal, and human. They fulfill the cosmic purpose of the entire creation. But the question is how? Why? Why do we think? Why do we say that each and an individual thing of these billions and billions of acts affects Hashem, really matters? So, to understand it a little bit is you can give the, the metaphor of what is the relationship of Hashem to the creation. You can think of a king with his subjects, a king, what is the king uh, concerned? That the people should obey. Does the king care whether a person in the other end of his kingdom wakes up in the morning and decides to put, up, to put on a white shirt or a blue shirt, it doesn't care. 
doesn't matter to him. What matters is that he stays obedient to the kingdom, to the king. And then you have a homemaker, a mother, who takes care of her home. A mother that takes care of her home, every little detail in the home is important to her. What's on the shelf, what's on the floor, what's on the ground, the people, what, who comes in and what goes out. Every little detail in the house is not, nothing is extra. Everything is little detail is important to make the home. So Hashem, this world is the home of Hashem. It's God's home. King versus mother. What a king is interested in is in the subject, the level of obedience. But the mother is interested in every detail in her home. And this world is God's home. Every little detail matters to Hashem. Do we know how it matters? Not necessarily. What is our job? We need to find godliness in every detail as much as we can. We need to find the connection, the godly connection in the details as much as we are able to. And this is something that the Rebbe, the Rebbe said. Look at this. Says the Rebbe, a simple example from everyday life, a successful homemaker or matron of a home is such that she supervises over every detail inside her home, ensuring that everything is in its proper place and that all runs smoothly. What's more, every detail in her home contributes to the overall, overall purpose of the, of the house. Nothing is for waste. And it can be said that nothing in this house is missing. Neither is there anything extra, nor serving the overall purpose of the home, not serving the overall purpose of the home. Every detail is important in, in to serve the home. It is so with running a physical home. Certainly it is so with the creator and master of the universe. Every tiny detail and event is by divine providence. What's more, every one of them contributes in some way to God's purpose for creation. Okay? So, based on this, after all explaining this deeper understanding of what divine providence, the question that we asked in the beginning is even stronger. We asked the question, what does it mean? Yeshua and Kalev say, that Hashem removed his shadow from the nations. What does that mean? And the answer is that although we are saying that there is a divine providence and care of Hashem for every little creature, yet it is not to be compared to the divine providence and the care that Hashem has on the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people here serve a higher purpose. The Jew is the representative of Hashem in this world. To bring the light of Hashem to this world. So the world is a world that God created. And everyone has a part in it. Every little creature, every little detail. The Gentile has the part of building the world. Hashem gave, it says, Loi latoyu bero, Hashem didn't create this world to be living in void and chaos. It is to settle. It is to bring a, a good world. But who is the one who introduces godliness in this world? This comes through the Jew that was chosen by Hashem. Hashem chose us and gave us that special neshama. And this is, in short, the answer to what Yeshua and Kalev are saying. 
that we are here now about to enter the land of Israel. We are chosen by Hashem to fulfill this mission. And therefore, the shadow is removed from them. Hashem is watching now to make sure that we are able to fulfill our mission. Says the Rebbe, according to Rashi's explanation, the non-Jews are under God's shade, which is consistent with Maimonides' position that they are part of God's divine providence. That said, it's clear that this divine providence is entirely unlike the divine providence over the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation that Hashem chose us. It's a, it's a whole, you give a whole separate class of what it means that the God chose us from among all other nations. And here's a, an article that's written by Rabbi Nochem Greenwald. He says, the divine providence over the Jewish people is not out of utility that Hashem wants to use it for something. Rather, it is simply because God chose us from all other nations. God desires and loves us with a love that transcends all reason or logic. God chose the very being of every Jew. As such, God's providence over the Jewish people is a one-sided providence that is not contingent upon the spiritual states of the Jewish people. God's providence never sways regardless of Jews, of a Jew's situation. And this one-sided and essential connection between God and the Jewish people is not limited to, overall, to the overall nation, not just that Hashem overall, overall protects the Jew, Rather, it is with every individual Jew. Each one is considered God's child. The bond between a parent and their child is absolute. As it doesn't flow from rational explanations. Rather, it is simply that the child is the very flesh of the parent. Thus, even if the child rebels against the parents, the bond is not severed. For something so absolute and tied to the essence never simply expires. So it is with every, so it is with every, every individual Jew. They are the child of the Father in heaven. So this answers the question. How can Rashi say that God simply removed his providence from them? The Kalev and Yeshua were explaining to the Jews that God's unique extra attention was no longer upon the inhabitants of Canaan. Now they were enjoyed, they were they were to enjoy it instead. The Jewish people, Hashem is now focused on the Jewish people to enter the land of Israel and to fulfill their mission right there in the land of Israel. That's what they were saying. And as the Rebbe explains, God's providence is in such a manner that every tiny detail is under the direct scrutiny of the divine. What's more, every detail contributes to the completion of the overall purpose of creation. But there is even more insofar as realizing what God truly wishes, the tiniest and most trivial detail is equally consequential to God as the biggest and most important matters. Everything enjoys equal providence. And this is the amazing lesson we take from here. If you ask what we do, does it matter? Oh, you better believe it. Every detail, every tiny, tiniest detail what we do, we wake up in the morning, we give tzedakah, we smile. It's not just when we pray. 
It's not just when we study Torah. Even the smallest things that we do throughout the day, the day matters to Hashem. And when we have this in mind, it gives a whole different perspective and it makes our life a whole more meaningful life. That we understand that whatever we do, it matters to Hashem. And we do it out of choice, not, not out of nature, out of choice. We choose to do this right thing. So if that matters to Hashem, that means if we ask Hashem to go bring already the fulfillment of the wishes to bring Mashiach, if we really say it with heartfelt prayer, then Hashem will surely give us Mashiach. So let us hope that this should happen very soon. Amen. Thank you. And, uh, join us for the morning classes in Atanya at 9.15. Bezat Hashem. Thank you, everybody. Great lecture. Thank you.